The Hispanic Historic Property Survey is something that the City of Phoenix Historic Preservation Office did in 2006. And our purpose for doing it was to really capture Hispanic history in the city. We realized that when the historic preservation efforts started in the 1970s and 1980s, we were looking at high style architecture and buildings that really told a story of kind of an elite Phoenix, um, where there were largely affluent and white residents in the buildings that they built. And we got to the point where we knew that we weren't telling the story of everyone in the city. And so the purpose of this survey was specifically to go back and to address Hispanic history so we could tell the story of Hispanic residents and get their point of view. So the focus of the survey was citywide, but there were two areas in particular where we paid special attention. The first was an area south of the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks to the Salt River between roughly 27th Avenue and 24th Street. And then the second area was south of the river down to Baseline Road from about 35th Avenue to 48th Street. So Arizona at one point was part of Mexico, and even before that it was part of Spain. Around the turn of the 17th century, um, it was part of Spain. And then in 1821, Mexico won its independence, and what is now Arizona was part of Mexico. The portion of what would become the state of Arizona north of the Gila River was acquired by the United States at the end of the war with Mexico in 1848. And the final southern boundary was established in 1854 with the ratification of the Gadsden Purchase, which added the land south of the Gila River. So in the 1860s, there, there still wasn't much here. Um, in 1865, Fort McDowell was established. And then in 1866, John Y. T. Smith began delivering hay from the Phoenix area to Camp McDowell. And there were several Mexicans who worked with him in that endeavor. Around that same time, a man named Jack Swilling moved to Prescott and then Wickenburg for mining activities and then ultimately ended up in Phoenix. He was married to a woman named Trinidad Escalante who was born in Mexico. And so Mr. and Mrs. Swilling became essentially the father and mother of Phoenix. Many people don't know that the mother of Phoenix was in fact Mexican. You know, in the 1870s, when the Phoenix Town site was created, there was a very strong Hispanic presence here. In fact, roughly 50% of the total population at that time was Mexican. There, if you, the, the census of the Phoenix area in those early years, close to half of the population was Mexican, Mexican-American. And that, that was 20 years after the war with Mexico. It was uh, 20 years after the war, but yet the Mexican, Mexican-American, people were coming from Mexico in here looking to make a living. Mexican-Americans, uh, when Tucson became part of the United States, uh, the Gadsden Purchase, they were American citizens, uh, but they were of Mexican descent. They started moving around looking to make a living. So one of the oldest remaining homes here in Phoenix is the Jones Montoya House, which is near 10th Street and Buckeye Road. It was built around 1879 by W.W. Jones, and his wife, who was Mexican, was Alcaria Montoya. And this is another example of a marriage between an Anglo man and a Hispanic woman, which is very common during the time. So the house, like many during that era, is constructed of adobe using uh, Mexican traditions. It still stands today. It's actually owned by Chicanos por la Casa and they rehabilitated it recently. And uh, it's a wonderful reminder of our early history. So Phoenix in the 1870s and 1880s was largely a town of adobe structures built by Mexican Americans. And there aren't any of those structures from that era that still survive, but there are a few from the turn of the century that are still around. By about 1900, bricks started to become the predominant building material. And there are two buildings near the corner of 3rd Street and Buchanan 
which was an early Hispanic barrio that still survived today. And those are Arvizu's El Fresnel grocery store, which was built around 1900, and Gerardo's building, which was built in the 1920s. So these two buildings were very near the railroad tracks that we know today along Harrison Street, just south of downtown. Interestingly, the railroad was built largely through Mexican labor. They helped um, grade the roadbed and lay the tracks. But this same railroad also created a physical barrier between north and south. There were also floods that took place in the 1890s from the Salt River that affected the south part of Phoenix. And so affluent residents left South Phoenix and went north and established neighborhoods in the north part of town. And poor people, largely people of color, were left behind. And that's where many of the Hispanic barrios were created. So the Phoenix barrios became the center of the Hispanic community. And again, these were largely south of Washington Street and south of the railroad tracks between roughly 15th Avenue on the west and 20th Street on the east. And there were several with different names. The oldest barrio west of Central Avenue is Grant Park, and it was known in its earliest years as La Palestina. It continued to develop in the teens and then through the 1930s. The Central Park Barrio is comprised of two subdivisions, which were platted between 1884 and 1893, and then Central Park Place, platted in 1910. And that neighborhood is in the area from Central Avenue to Third Street, and from Buchanan down to Buckeye Street. And this area was heavily affected in the late 19th century by the floods. But it also had one of the first four parks in the city of Phoenix, although it was undeveloped until the 1930s. The Harmon Park and Los Soranita neighborhoods were divisions of an early barrio named El Mesquital, or the Mesquite Grove. And this early neighborhood, established in the teens, stretched from Central to 15th Avenues and from Buckeye Road south to Watkins Road. Later, the smaller barrio west of 7th Avenue formed as Los Soranita, and a portion of the area east of 7th Avenue became known as Harmon Park. Another well-known neighborhood is the Golden Gate Barrio, which is bounded by the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks and Buckeye Road, and then from 16th to 20th Streets. And it became a magnet for Mexican families who were seeking a better life than could be found in Southern Arizona or in Mexico. And many of the residents of this barrio worked as agricultural laborers or worked in packing sheds. The Cuatro Milpas Barrio was started in the 1920s. And it was originally comprised of four large parcels of farmland owned by several different families. Cuatro Milpas meant four fields. This barrio formed roughly between Buckeye Road and Mojave Street and from 12th to 14th Streets. Surrounding this core were agricultural areas with scattered residences. Families living in this area planted and harvested corn in abundance. The El Campito Barrio began around 1927 in the area from 7th to 16th Streets and Lincoln Street to Buckeye Road. This area acquired its name because of all the mesquite trees that thrived in the area. It was discovered that everything south of downtown Phoenix was in a floodplain, and so it became less attractive. If you had money, you wanted to build north of Phoenix, and all of a sudden minorities started coming into Phoenix looking for a housing, living to where to live, and they found that the land south of Phoenix was cheaper. Uh, the, the area south of Phoenix uh, uh, started growing, and, and you ended up with what they call barrio areas, uh, Cuatro Milpas, Grant Park, um, Golden Gate, uh, there, there were, uh, and, the, and this is something that's done in Mexico, by the way. If you go to Mexico, they have barrios like that. So it was, uh, they would come in, and these were almost cities on their own. You also had other minorities living here. You had black areas where the black Americans lived. You also had Chinatown where the Chinese lived. So uh, there was, uh, you had segregated areas. Uh, the only one that w in the Phoenix area that was done by law was the blacks. They, they really, uh, like the black high school, the grammar schools, uh, by law they had to go to their own school. 
Hispanics in the Phoenix area were not segregated at school, but it could have been because they the schools that were built here were built in the, in the barrio areas where the Hispanics lived. What I remember uh, growing up was that, first of all, we were a very close knit community. And my community was on 7th Avenue and Pima, which is just a couple of blocks north of the I-17 freeway, the bridge. So I was in South, well, I, I guess you would say South Central, Southwest Phoenix in that, in that area. And it was called La Sonorita Barrio. Okay? And I don't know why it was La Sonorita, unless some of the people that, that lived there were from Sonora, Mexico, I, I, I don't know, because we were a uh, Mexican-American, which is Chicano, you know, the, the word, you know, born here, but yet have relatives in Mexico is Chicano. And the ancient word was with an X, Chicano. So, you know, the Chicas, those are, it's all part of our names. So we were there and so were uh, black families lived there. Across from the street from us lived the Gray's family. They owned a uh, gas station. I believe that gas station is still there. Maybe, uh, you know, operated by one of the grandchildren of Mr. and Mrs. Gray. And then there was um, all kinds of, of, of other people there. There was the uh, Chinese people that lived there who were the Wongs and the Fays. They had supermarkets there. So it was a, a wonderful place to live, very multicultural. There were some white people there as well, but the majority were the Latinos and the black and some Chinese. The Lowell School was constructed in 1922 on a site near 2nd Avenue and Yavapai Street and offered classes from kindergarten through eighth grade. When children graduated from grant school, they often went on to Lowell School. My education, my first school was grant school, and that was demolished years ago. It was right by where El Portal is. Some, some of your uh, listeners may know where El Portal is, right by Grant Park. And right close to Central Avenue off of Grant, that's where grant school was. So I went there for the first seven years. And then because they didn't have an eighth grade there, we went to Lowell School. So I went to Lowell School for one year, but grant school, the children from Dunbar, okay, and let me show a little bit more demographics of the barrio where I come from. Like I said, it was a African-American, black barrio, Chicano, Mexican, you know, Mexican meaning they were they were recently arrived from Mexico, Chinese, and, and a scattering of, of Anglo. Along with education, religion played an important role in the lives of Hispanic Phoenicians. And back in the 1880s, um, the Hispanic population was almost entirely Catholic. And so St. Mary's Church, which is now St. Mary's Basilica, has very strong ties to the Hispanic community here in Phoenix. In fact, the land was donated by Mexican-American businessmen, and Mexican-Americans were very much involved in the construction and uh, operation of the church. The Adobe Church was the site of religious services as well as many cultural celebrations. However, when Father Novatus Benzing took over the pastorship of the church in 1896, he began a policy of segregation. In 1902, the original Adobe Church constructed by parishioners was demolished and a basement structure replaced it. So they, 1881, they built St. Mary's Catholic Church, an Adobe uh, building built by the Mexicans themselves, labor, they put the labor to build the church, and, and um, uh, the land under that church was donated by Mexican merchants, so that it was, uh, uh, because anybody else who was here, was uh, many of them were not Catholic, but the Mexicans were all Catholic, so they wanted a church early. Just a little adobe church uh, w was, uh, established for the Mexican community. They came to church here. Then in 1893, the Franciscans came in, Franciscan order, under uh, Novatus Benzing, who was the pastor of the, uh, of the Franciscans. He was a German, born in Germany, very strict. The gates to heaven were that wide. Uh, and, and he uh, 
said, you know what, I'm going to build a new church here. And he's the one that built the Catholic church that you see downtown today. The Hispanic parishioners appealed to the diocese in Tucson and ultimately got permission to build a new church in 1928, which became Immaculate Heart of Mary Church at 9th Street in Washington. They brought in Claritian priests from Spain under uh, a priest named Antimo, Father Antimo Nevrera, who was the pastor, uh, became the pastor, and his first uh, job was to build a church for the center of the Hispanic community, and that was Immaculate Heart. And it was built around 1929. And it was, uh, uh, the masses would all be in Spanish, and, and it was basically serving the Hispanic community. 1848, the Galician priests built the church that we're in today at St. Anthony's Catholic Church. The bishop came from Tucson to dedicate this church, and it was in the center of a large Hispanic community. The Mexican people had to meet in the basement. There was no access to them in, in, in the regular church. And that's the way they segregated. You know, the Anglos were uh, on the inside the church, and the Mexicans' Immaculate Heart was the same way for, for a time. Now, my church, my parish church, was St. Anthony's. And it's right off of Central, and right there, uh, Central and, and Grant Street in that area. And that was where I, you know, made my communion, got baptized, and got married, and, and everything else. So faith was another powerful source of energy, beauty, and history for us. While most Hispanics in early Phoenix were Catholic, there were Protestant churches as well. One of these was the First Mexican Baptist Church, which began as a mission in 1917. They eventually built their own building in 1923, and then it was expanded in 1928. This new facility became known as the Mexican Baptist Christian Center. In 1938, the church built a new church building at 10th Street in Jefferson, which still stands today. So during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as Hispanic residents found themselves pushed further to the margins, they created organizations and associations that helped them become more empowered. One of the most important groups was the Friendly House, which was started by an Anglo group called the Phoenix Americanization Committee in 1922. This community house provided classes in English, citizenship, hygiene, and homemaking. When Placida Garcia Smith became the director in 1931, she worked to establish stronger ties to the Hispanic community. She helped operate federal economic assistance programs under the Great Depression. Since eligibility for relief programs required citizenship, English and Americanization classes also increased at the Friendly House. Garcia Smith worked as a member of the Southside Improvement Association and worked to increase services in local parks establish a Will Baby Clinic, and provide daycare. She went on to win Phoenix Woman of the Year for her efforts. Of course, Friendly House was located in the Grant Park neighborhood, and the centerpiece of that neighborhood was the park itself. Grant Park uh, was developed during the 1930s, during the Depression, as there was a city bond election that provided funding to uh, do development at the park. And Harmon Park is another park that's just a little bit further south of Grant Park. It was also developed around the same time. Both Grant Park and Harmon Park were very popular among uh, Mexican-American residents. And in fact, there were sports teams that played there and many community gatherings that took places at both parks. Both of these parks also had pools, which were very popular with Hispanic residents during the summertime. So one of the effects of discrimination for Hispanics in early Phoenix was the fact that they could not get home loans and realtors would not sell and banks would not loan to people of color. And so they were largely relegated to live south of the tracks and unfortunately this led to uh, many cases of substandard construction. So one of the efforts to alleviate this was by a gentleman who was an Anglo priest, a Catholic priest, by the name of Emmett McLaughlin. And Father Emmett uh, saw a need and he worked hard to address it. He was able to create what became known as the Phoenix Housing Authority. And the Phoenix Housing Authority created three public housing projects. 
They were all segregated. Uh, one was for Anglos. It was known as the Frank Luke Project. It was near 16th Street in Van Buren. There was also one for African Americans known as the Matthew Henson Housing Project near 7th Avenue and Grant Street. And then the third was the Marcos de Nisa Housing Project for Mexican Americans, and it was near Yavapai and First Avenue. A man named Roy Yanez was the director of the Marcos de Nisa Housing Project, and he later became the executive director of the Phoenix Housing Authority and was a prominent individual. Hispanic Americans played an important role in World War II, both at home and abroad. They fought in Europe and the Pacific, and many were highly decorated, including Silvestre Herrera, who earned the Medal of Honor. At home, Farm Bureau agencies successfully lobbied Congress for the Bracero Program, which approved in late 1942, allowed employers to hire Mexican national guest workers to meet wartime agricultural demands. This program continued long past the end of the war. Mexican Americans who fought in World War II returned home only to find that they faced discrimination when they got here. Many of the freedoms that they had fought for valiantly were being denied to them. And so a group got together here in Phoenix in 1945 and created an American Legion post. This was post 41. It was created by Ray Martinez and Frank Pipafuentes. And they went on to uh, fight for equality among uh, veterans specifically, but all Hispanic residents in Phoenix. Post 41 constructed a new building right across from Grand Park and it was completed in 1948. And this group saw rapid growth, increasing from just 300 members in 1947 to almost 1,000 members by 1950. The Legion members focused on discrimination against Hispanics in housing, in schools, in city pools, and in the political arena. Well, I know that we had a lot of pride with uh, our servicemen because I had a lot of uncles who served. They went either to World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, and so forth. And then the whole neighborhood, you know, the, my, my story, Let Their Spirits Dance, is about a, a soldier from Phoenix who is uh, killed in the Vietnam War. And then in post-war Vietnam, the family makes a decision. The mother, you know, has a, a, a supernatural experience concerning her son and she decides that she needs to get to the Vietnam Memorial Wall to honor her son, to touch his name, because you can literally touch their names on, on, those, on the uh, Vietnam Memorial Wall. And so the story is set here in Phoenix, and the pride that we had in our service people, you know, going to wars, and, and some of them didn't come back. So the war, the, the war that most affected me was the Vietnam War, and it affected the entire neighborhood because you know, they went into literally the kids who weren't going to necessarily go on to school, which were a lot of the brown and black kids, and they took them away and they, they drafted them literally in the Vietnam War, and they were put on the front lines. Not all of them, but a lot of them served on the front lines and a lot of them died. Following World War II, churches continued to play an important role in the Hispanic community. And important churches during this time included Batania Presbyterian Church, Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and St. Anthony's Catholic Church. Batania Presbyterian Church grew out of a mission created by the first Presbyterian Church in 1924. By 1950, the congregation was able to create its own building at 3rd Avenue and Pima Street. Reverend T.F. Salazar assumed leadership and the church was renamed Batania Presbyterian. Although the church never had a large congregation, its service to the community included a kitchen that provided free lunches to children from Lincoln, Grant, Lowell, and Monroe schools. The women of the church also participated in a ladies' aid society that worked to meet the needs of the church and those who were less fortunate. St. Anthony's Catholic Church was originally established in a small structure on 7th Street between Yavapai and Maricopa Streets in 1925. In 1948, four priests were sent from the Diocese of Tucson to build a new church in the Grant Park area to minister to Hispanic parishioners in outlying agricultural areas. Between 1946 and 1948, parishioners donated money toward the tiles and bricks for the construction. The building was designed based on a church in Spain by the architectural firm of Lesher and Mahoney. 
Sacred Heart Catholic Church, which is located near 16th Street in Buckeye, was dedicated in 1956. The congregation was led by former World War I and World War II Army Chaplain, Father Albert Braun. He was also the chaplain for the American Legion Post 41. Father Braun helped the neighborhoods near the church get paved streets, sidewalks, sewers, street lights, and city water. The church also formed its own St. Vincent de Paul Society and youth service organization. Sacred Heart Church is now the only building remaining in the Golden Gate Barrio, which was demolished to create the Sky Harbor Center. Basically what the Catholic Church tried to do was provide uh, churches where the communities were. And as the community grew, uh, like north of McDowell, there was St. Agnes, and up north there was St. Francis. Those are two of the earliest churches built after St. Mary. St. Mary's was number one. It was the earliest. St. Matthew's was very early too. And, and again, uh, then you had the Immaculate Heart of Mary was probably the next after St. Mary's. I, the bishop came in and the first thing he did, he says, there won't be this Hispanic and Anglo uh, communities. We're all under the bishop now. And he said that uh, we, we're not going to be separating uh, Mexican Catholics from Anglo Catholics. And, and of course, then you saw things like Mexican masses being said in many of the churches in the valley where there was a time where that wasn't done. I should mention is Father Emmett McLaughlin. Uh, in 1930s, he came uh, uh, and uh, he came into one of the poorest areas of uh, Phoenix. Seventh Avenue and Buckeye, if you go west of that area, you're in the black neighborhood. If you go east of that area, you're in the Mexican-American neighborhood. And Emmett McLaughlin built a church right on 7th Avenue. Today it's called St. Pius. After World War II, Mexican-Americans in Phoenix continued to create new businesses. And one of these was in the Grant Park neighborhood. It was the El Portal restaurant. It still exists today at the corner of 2nd Avenue and Grant Street. It was established in 1947 by Mercedes Zapien with her two sons who had served in World War II. It was later acquired by Earl and Mary Rose Wilcox, uh, Mary Rose Wilcox being the first Hispanic woman to serve on both the Phoenix City Council and the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. During the post-war era, as businesses expanded, the population in general here in the valley just exploded. There were about 10,000 Hispanic residents here in Phoenix in 1940, but by 1960, that number had grown over 60,000. And this transition was seen at the nearby schools. Monroe School, in particular, initially had a very large Anglo population, but by the 1960s, it was predominantly Hispanic. Similar to Monroe School, the demographics of Phoenix Union High School shifted after World War II. The student body became predominantly Mexican-American and African-American, and by 1970, there was significant racial conflict. The school suffered from a lack of financial investment, and students were often pushed toward vocational education. Hispanic parents met with Chicanos por la Causa and drafted a list of demands for the Phoenix Union High School principal, including more Hispanic teachers and courses, better facilities, and increased security. When the school did not respond with adequate changes, CPLC and the parents organized a boycott, which lasted three weeks and included roughly half of the student body. The groups negotiated a settlement, which included new curriculum. So here I go to uh, graduate from there. And it was, a tough, it was a tough road because we were kids sometimes not designated for college. We had to show and prove ourselves. You see what I'm saying? Because there was a, uh, some type of a cultural or discriminatory way of looking at us at times and saying, no, you, you can just go to, to be a secretary or you can just go to, to, go to uh, become a mechanic to some of these, these young men because they didn't see us as moving forward. We had no money. We had no way of moving to a, a new educational level. But what happened also during the time I was in middle school was that um, uh, Olivares, you know, came on board because she had been hired to to uh, mentor us 
it was a, a mentoring program for children who, who were seen as capable of going to college. And that was a big deal. So that helped us. Mentoring programs helped us immensely to make a move into the colleges. And then that's when I decided to go ahead and start at Phoenix College. The 1960s and 1970s were a period of community activism and protests, not just here in Phoenix, but throughout the country. Here in Phoenix, we saw many protests with the Hispanic community, particularly with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. What happened was I've been protesting since I was 14 years old. And I started with the, the people. I wish that Dr. King had been here. <laughs> I don't know if, if he had been already killed at that time or not, I'm not sure. But, oh, how I wish I had a photo. But I was just a little kid, you know, nobody was gonna, was gonna take a look at this 14 year old. But they were very embracing of me. And they put me right there and I was holding hands with all singing, we shall overcome and all these wonderful things. And so from then on, I have been extremely dedicated to, uh, to all of our Chicano issues as well. I've marched for uh, Cesar Chavez as well, worked uh, along the border in the name of Cesar Chavez when I was at, uh, in college. So I did a lot of work there with the, some of the farm workers. And then I went on to do work with, uh, with different Chicano organizations. One of the most important locations during this time was the Santa Rita Center at 10th Street in Hadley. And this building was constructed by the Sacred Heart Parish in 1963 to provide catechism classes and a community hall for the El Campito residents. But it's most famous for its association with Cesar Chavez's 1972 hunger strike. In 1972, House Bill 2134 was introduced to the Arizona State Legislature. The bill restricted the power of unions to strike during harvest and required that laborers continue to work in the fields during labor disputes or face criminal penalties. Boycotts of products and retailers were also prohibited. The bill passed, and the next day, roughly 500 farm workers and supporters marched to the state capitol. Cesar Chavez spoke at the capitol and vowed a hunger strike, which he conducted at the Santa Rita Center. Chavez's fast of love gained national attention and garnered widespread support. He was hospitalized after the 21st day of the fast and lasted an additional three days before breaking the fast with a communion. I got very involved with Cesar Chavez. I remember marching with, of course, the people of Cesar Chavez in high school. But when I was around, I want to say 14 years old, the um, people of Martin Luther King Jr. in those days came into Phoenix. And I recall marching, I don't know why, but I was on the front line. I was just a kid. I don't know why they allowed me to be holding hands with some of these people. And I was on the front line marching with the people of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Did other kids come with me? I don't recall anyone else of ch children, you know, young kids being with me. I would do these things on my own. So activism continued in the 1960s and it spread to college campuses. In 1968, a group of ASU students formed the Mexican American Student Organization. Other important organizations created during this time include the Mexican American Political Association, founded in 1964, and Chicanos por la Casa, founded in 1969. By the 1970s, Hispanic activism had paid off, and we see that uh, many Hispanics were elected to office, including Raul Castro, who became governor in 1974, holding the highest office in the state. And we still see it today with four members of the Phoenix City Council who are Hispanic uh, for the first time ever. The Hispanic Historic Property Survey was important because it helps to really tell the story of Hispanics in Phoenix. And we see the challenges that they faced and the obstacles that they overcame. And I, for one, am inspired by the story. I think it's a great story. It continues today. There's still struggles and challenges, but we see that uh, Hispanics have made a tremendous contribution to Phoenix and to Arizona, and that contribution continues. Say, we knew what was going on, but I don't think we understood that it would last forever into the history of who we were. 
you know, we weren't used to making history. Am I making sense to you? We were not used to making history. We were used to being on the fringes, you see? So I never thought, gosh, I'm going to go take a picture over there with, with Cesar Chavez and you know, his people. It, it never occurred to me, you see? Because we were so, how should I say, our mindset was that we were the lower class. We didn't have the voice. We didn't have this, we didn't have that. And it took leaders like Cesar Chavez to energize us. And like he said, education should end in service to others. He's absolutely, absolutely right. And that's what I, I have sought to do. I served at uh, Cesar Chavez High School. I was their first uh, counselor coming in, you know, a head of counseling coming into a brand new school. Very proud to serve in a, in a high school. Finally named for uh, this great leader that was born here in Arizona. Cesar Estrada Chavez. So I was very proud to do that.